Good morning. Good morning, UCC. Family, friends, visitors, we thank God for another beautiful day, another first Sunday in a new month, the month of March. As we continue to go forward right now, amen, we thank God for each and every one of you who are on this call today and who will be participating in this worship service. This is Communion Sunday, so I pray that you have your crackers, your juice, whatever sacraments that you will use as we pray over those sacraments and we want to commune and to be on one accord when we do it, especially during this time of social distancing. We use uh, technology in order to keep us connected and there's no better way to be connected than to commune with Jesus. So today we want to commune and thank the Lord Jesus all over again for what he is doing and what he's already done. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we will proceed on today. Amen? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and bless you for another day. We pray, O oh God, that you would take control of this atmosphere as only you can. Let your word go forward today. Give us a rhyme of word, O oh God, a word that we can hold fast to, and that we can continue to use as we fight the good fight. And we know that we are victorious in you, and because of you, we have glory. We give you peace. We give you praise. And we thank you now in Jesus' name. It is so. Amen, amen, and amen. All amen praises to the God of peace. Let's go into the word of the Lord today. Amen. Let's get right into this word from the Lord. And let's go into the Old Testament into 1 Samuel chapter 18. And we want to read verses 10 through 12. So it's good to know Jesus. Amen. It's good to know the power and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ and our Heavenly Father who cares about all of us. He is the God of light and not darkness. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 10 through 12. I will be reading from the NASB translation, the opening scriptures on today. Amen. First Samuel 18, beginning with verse 10. The word of the Lord says this. Now it came about on the next day that an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul, and he raved in the midst of the house while David was playing the harp with his hand. As usual, and a spear was in Saul's hand. Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped from his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of David, for the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Let's pray our corporate prayer together on this morning, amen, another way to get us in sync and all on one accord. So just please repeat after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, please prepare my ears to hear your word. Prepare my heart to receive your word. Prepare my eyes to see that your word is alive and prepare my body to be your temple for the living word. Amen, amen, amen. We find here in this section of scripture that we have read about Saul and David, and I tell you, there have probably have been millions and millions of sermons preached about Saul and David's relationship, and it was a very convoluted relationship. David was a man after God's own heart. Saul was the very first king of Israel, and he started out well, but what was within him eventually came out. So we find by the time we reach here in the 18th chapter of 1 Samuel that there is a situation that's taking place. And what we want to talk to you from, let me give you a quick little phrase. We want to talk to you from this phrase. I want to talk to you about spears of hate. Spears of hate. So there's a word that's in that phrase, and the word is hate. 
And the spear is an instrument that would demonstrate the hate that Saul is feeling towards David. And it's also similar to when we hear the term of fiery darts. And we know that the scripture, the word of God, tells us about these fiery darts. And it tells us in Ephesians 6.16 uh, that we should take up the shield of faith so that we can be able to extinguish all the fiery darts or flaming arrows that the enemy will send against us. So we know that hatred is a heartfelt condition. And when we look at the term hatred, we know that it is a feeling, however, that can be both godly and sinful. Hatred in and of itself. And I know that sounds a little strange to you, doesn't it? The word hatred or to hate can be both godly or sinful depending on what it is that is causing us to hate. What am I saying? Biblically speaking, there are positive and negative aspects to hatred. When we hate the things that God hates, it is acceptable to hate. Psalm 97, verse 10, the first part of verse 10 says this, Let those who love the Lord hate evil. So when we have hatred for evil, when we have hatred for sin, when we have hatred for the things that's not going to bring God glory, that's a good type of hate. But see, when we think about hate in the natural sense, and the first thing that comes to our mind, it's not about uh, hating the things that God hates. When we hear the term hate or hatred, we think about things that other people would direct to either each other or even to you or even to me. So we make hatred personal. Because it is personal. It has a root. It has a very strong root. At the very root of hatred is envy. Envy begets hatred, and hatred produces envy. So those two things go hand in hand. When we look at what was happening here with Saul, see, Saul didn't just immediately begin to hate David. For those of you who are well aware of their relationship, we know that, amen, if you back up a little bit, you see that David was the one who came to the palace to, uh, you know, to be able to help Saul when those evil spirits would come upon him because he was gifted in playing music. So the music that David would play would cause the evil spirit to leave Saul. Why was this evil spirit upon Saul? Why was Saul so tormented? Well, we have to back up just a little bit so we can see how all of this hatred uh, comes to pass here. First Samuel chapter 16 said and lets us know that you know Saul has now begun uh, to take it upon himself to do things by himself and not to obey the will of God. That's why Samuel told him, you know, that uh, it's better to obey than to sacrifice things to God. You have to read back a little further on that. But in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse number 13 and 14, we find these words. 1 Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, David, in the midst of his brothers, and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. So now David has been anointed by God, and now God's spirit rests upon David. But see, it's one thing about God's spirit. God's spirit can rest upon more than one at the same time. It depends on the individual. So verse 14, 1 Samuel 16 and 14 says this. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. So the reason why Saul now is needing to be soothed at times when this evil spirit uh, comes upon him is because God's protection is now no longer upon Saul. And people have to understand what the scripture means when it says an evil spirit from the Lord. We know that God does not produce evil. It wasn't the fact that God himself put an evil spirit upon Saul, but when God removed his protection, he allowed Satan to fill the gap. Saul was vulnerable. He did not have the spirit of God upon him anymore. So now he's vulnerable, so Satan is allowed to uh, torment Saul with these demonic forces. 
So whenever Saul would go into this state, he needed some type of anointed, soothing music. And David was the one that produced it. So what was it then that turned Saul so much against David? What is it that turns people so much against us? You can say, this is my friend today, and then tomorrow you're shaking your head. You're wondering, what happened? There were spears that were already in the works, and those spears produced hate. What am I saying? Stay with me here. And when we look at chapter 18, and just before we get to verse 10, where we started reading, we saw that David was a warrior. David had been set over the men of war. So David would lead men out to war when they fought against the Philistine. And in verse 6, 1 Samuel 18 and 6, it said it happened as they were coming when David returned from killing the Philistine that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul. Oh, Saul was all up in himself. Here, everybody comes out to meet me. So he's already puffed up. When people are puffed up, they already have been inflated, prideful, egotistical. Satan is just blowing them left and right. So Saul is saying, they're coming out to meet me. And as they came out, Amen. With their tambourines and with joy and with musical instruments. Then verse 7 deflated Saul. The women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul became very angry for this saying displeased him. And he said they have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they have, ascri they have ascribed thousands. Now, what more can he have but the kingdom? So verse 9 says, Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. What does, what does that mean? It means he became envious. As soon as he heard the people giving David more credit, Saul equated that with personal glory. See, God wants us not to be caught up in this thing about egos and how many times your name is called versus my name versus his name versus her name. God said, your heart is not right when you are controlled by how you view other people are giving you a prideful lift. That's the issue with politicians. That's why no party can just be a happy about what another group is accomplishing if it's not them. <laughs> it's all of this pride. It's all about me. And that's why we find ourselves in a perpetual circle trying to break out of trouble because of schism and division and people not doing what needs to be done. A perfect example is this pandemic that we're dealing with right now. One half says there's nothing to it. Another half says be very careful and do what's right so that we can uh, complete what we're doing and everybody can be back. Uh, as business as normal. But the next side said, but we don't want you to get all the credit for it. Making it, it looks like you are the one that's going to bring it all to pass. So I'm going to change your agenda. I'm going to change your timeline. It's envy. It's schism. It's division. And Saul's hard now. Why? Because the spirit of God has departed. We must have the spirit of God in our life. If we don't have the spirit of God, then we are subject to whatever the enemy wants to do. The Holy Spirit is our keeper. He's our guide. And Jesus gives it to us uh, freely for all of those who belong to him. He said, if you don't belong to me, you won't have my spirit. But if you belong to me, you have my spirit. So the qualification is we must belong to Jesus in order to receive and to have his spirit. Dr. Martin Luther King told us, he said one of his very famous quotes, he says, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. You can't keep dipping and dabbling with messed up stuff and messed up people and think you're going to be blessed. Think you're going to come out of that thing. Darkness cannot drive out darkness when there's issues and troubles and problems. It's only light that must come in to chase away darkness. He says, hate cannot drive out hate. We can't keep hating each other and think that things are going to get better and think that God is going to be blessing in the midst of what's going on. 
He said only love can do that. Only love can drive out hate. Only light can drive out darkness. So we understand then that God's ways are perfect. But the enemy is looking to get in to cause the issues and problems on our daily lives. Within the places where we live, within our nation, within our community, within our churches, within our home, Satan is looking for opportunities to get in and to have free reign. And so Saul has put himself in position for the devil to get him and to speak into his ear, to tell him, now, David is your enemy. He's not even looking at what David is doing to bring benefits to him. See, if we miss what God is doing, how we're receiving blessings all around uh, people and circumstances and where God has positioned us, then we will miss what God is intending for the next step in our lives to be. So Saul, because he no longer has God's spirit upon him, only can see things fleshly. And he sees with an envious heart and an envious spirit. So what did he do? Verse 10, now that he's operating in hatred and envy. Verse 10 says, now it came about on the next day. See, Saul, this thing is already burning in him because of what the women had just said and how the people had given David more glory than he had received when they returned from the battle. On the very next day, he's just meditating. He's just thinking. Or he's angry. And don't you know Satan is in there pushing it? <laughs> if you give him an opportunity, he will grab hold to it and he will just push that negative thought throughout your entire day. You can't sleep at night. You think about something, how you interpreted what you think somebody said and they really didn't even mean harm. It wasn't even in their heart. They were just doing what they knew to do. It was them. But when the enemy is given insight, when he has opportunity, he's going to twist that. He's going to twist it so that we won't have that peace. A victim state of mind is what he wants God's people to walk with. He wants us to feel like we are victims. Amen. When we are in the midst of trials and circumstances and situations, instead of him wanting us to amen, hold, go, grab hold of real tight to God's unchanging hands, he wants us to feel like God has left us and we are victims and amen. we should not have to hold on and ask God to be there with us. God is teaching us. God is uh, 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 manipulating circumstances and situations for our good. The Bible says all things work together for our good. But when we see ourselves as a victim of other people are hating us, we open ourselves up for things that God does not want us to have. I'm going to share something with you here as we prepare for communion here very shortly here. So verse 10 says, the, uh, came about on the next day that an evil spirit from God, again, God allowed this evil spirit from Satan to take hold. It came about mightily upon Saul. Oh man, Satan now has him. Anytime you see when the enemy is shaking people to the core and you can't understand why they're looking like that, why their countenance has changed like that, why their words, they don't even seem to be the same person. They're meditating on wrong and hateful things. The enemy has taken up root and the spirit of God is not in that zip code. So the Bible says, and he raved in the midst of the house. He's going about like a madman. He's just angry. While David was playing, now in the past, David had been able to soothe him. See, David's role, he still played all of the roles that God gave him. He was a warrior. He would go out with the military. He didn't get the big head and say, now I can't come back and serve my king by playing amen, on this instrument because I am also gifted in this area. These are my gifts that God has given to me. And God uses me to help the king of Israel to calm down and not to be out of control so that the people won't be harmed and God's people will be blessed. While David was playing the harp with his hand, Saul had a spear in his hand. David had a harp. And Saul had a spear. So the spear in the mind of a fleshly person thinks they have more control and more power than what a child of God has in his hand. 
A spear in the hand of a person that's controlled by Satan cannot compare with a child of God who has the word of God in his hand. David was using the instrument for good, a heart. Saul had this spear. And verse 11 says, Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. I'm going to get rid of him right now. I'm going to kill him and get rid of him. That rage that had built up in him, that envy had now turned into full bore hatred. But David escaped from his presence. Now, if the scripture just stopped right there, we would think that, okay, David moved very quickly one time and then Saul missed him. But no, look at what he said. David escaped from his presence twice. The devil tried to kill him once and then David dodged him or either God deflected the spear. The Bible don't tell us how Saul missed him, but we know he did not kill him. He did not pin him to the wall. But then the Bible said David must have picked his heart right back up and went right back to doing what he was there to do. And Saul tried to kill him again. David escaped him twice. Now, we would probably say, okay, God, once, <laughs> that's enough. My focus was fine, but this man is trying to kill me twice. Now, I know I got to get some revenge. You were, you were with me when, I, when we killed Goliath. You've been with me when we went out to fight the Philistine. Let me take the head off of my enemy right here. That was not David's heart. David's heart was, God, you have me in this position here. I'm trusting you because you have not told me to do anything different at this point. If David has succumbed to what uh, the enemy was trying to get him to do in that situation, he would not have been the man who has been described as a man after God's own heart. A man who trusted God in spite of and because of everything. See, Proverbs 14 and 30 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. What does that mean? It means when you are trusting in God, he will give you peace. You won't be wasteful. You won't get caught up in those envies and all of that other list of things that produces jealousy and that produces uh, people who want to take you out because they don't like your presence because you remind them that they are not living right. It's only your very presence. There's nothing that you are doing. There are spears of hate that the devil has produced in the lives of other people who are not connected to him. And we understand that by being children of God. When we leave home and we think this is going to be a great day. And as soon as we get out, it seems like things just begin to fall apart. We begin to cry out to God. Well, God, what in the world is going on here? It seems like everybody is coming against me today. God is saying, this is the day that I'm going to take you higher. This is the day when you're going to be tested to see, will you continue to represent me as light? Or will you succumb to the fiery darts of the enemy and these spears of hate that's being thrown at you? Will you give in to the urges of the flesh? Or will you take a deep breath and ask me for direction? And what the enemy think he is doing for evil, that he means that's evil for you. The Bible has already told us that God would take it here to turn it around for good. And the people that were watching you in that circumstance and in that situation, you didn't ask them for it. But they have elevated you in a spiritual sense to say this is a person, a true man and woman of God. This is a person that we can listen to. Because they did not fall down and give in to that trick and that trap. When the devil throws spirits of hate like Saul through that spirit at David, amen. We understand that God is able to deflect that spear. Or he will move us away from that situation and circumstance. And the Bible tells us when Saul was not able to kill David, verse 12 says, Now Saul was afraid of David, for the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. It, it summed up all in that. No matter what happened after that, when the evil spirit would come upon Saul, he would still try to uh, kill David. He would try to set David up in different warfare so that he could die in battle and all of that. But it did not matter. Verse 12 summed it all up. In Saul's moment 
of rationality, he was able to see exactly why he couldn't harm David. The devil wants to take us out. We understand that. Why? Because, amen, the Bible already lets us know <laughs> that if we leave here, we will still be blessed abundantly when we go to be with the Lord. Paul said, you know, I'm caught between two places. I don't know. It, uh, it will be better for you if I stay here. But my real desire is, is to go to be with the Lord. We win and we win. We don't lose when we operate with Jesus. And so the key is when the enemy realizes that he can't harm you with his tricks and the things that he throw after you, he is really afraid of you. That's really why he tries to eliminate the people of God from his circumstances, from his atmosphere, because he is afraid. His spirit is afraid. He feels the presence of God. What do we do? We do like David did. We stay steadfast, unmovable. We don't give in. We don't take down. We walk uprightly before our God, and we live for him. The greatest example of love overpowering hate in the Bible is what Jesus did when he overpowered the torture and the murder that the enemies of our Lord, the Jewish leaders who he made very uncomfortable, he demonstrated and called them out on their prideful spirit, on their hypocrisy, on how they their old thing was all about getting power and how they had hatred in their hearts for people who really lived and spoke up right for God. Jesus, the cross, he endured it for you and for me. And because of the love that he had for us, he was able to endure hatred and his love for us has conquered all hate. We can't give in. We cannot give in. And we desire right now to be the vessels and the children of the Lord. Oh, yes, the enemy will come. Yes, he will. And we are not surprised when he shows up. We understand that when the spears of hate are thrown against us, we have the shield of faith. The shield of faith that will deflect all flaming arrows. All fiery dust. And if we get wounded in the battle, we say, Lord, here's a wound. I give my wound over to you. Help me to become stronger. Teach me what it is I'm supposed to glean from this. But I'm not going to turn back on you. Because my ultimate victory is in front of me. And I must endure to the end. So there are spears of hate. But love that proceeds from God that would not allow us to be overcome by that hate. We walk in the same way that David walked. Titus 3 and 3 says, at one time, we understand where these people are coming from. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. It used to be, you said, nobody better not look at me twice like that. I told, I'll show them who I am. They don't know who they're messing with. We used to think like that at one time. I pray we don't, you don't still think like that. I'm praying that I will continue. Amen. If that feeling comes, I will not receive it. So he goes on to say, we lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. At one time, we used to do that. But at this time, we are able to deflect and see those spears of hate coming and thank God for the victory because of the blood that Jesus Christ has already shed. And because he shed his blood, we are able today to stand fast in the liberty, the freedom where he has set us free. So all of that envy, gossiping, maliciousness, idolatry, amen, sorcery, all of those things, we find hate included in that list of things that God is not pleased with and things that will keep us out of heaven. Hatred will keep you out of heaven. But no way, Jose. Jesus has already given us everything that we need to be victorious. So because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we're here today and we want to prepare at this time 
for communion. But before we take communion, we want to just pause and ask, is there anyone who's listening to me today? You're not saved. You're allowing the spirit of Satan to control you. And you realize there are things that you're doing. There are things that come out of your mouth. There are things that your body is allowed to do that you're really not pleased with. But you just don't have the strength. None of us have the strength naturally to reject every temptation and thing that Satan puts in our, plan, in our path. Sometimes we might even blow up and then say, oh God, I'm so sorry. But if you don't have Jesus, you don't have a chance for the victory that God wants you to have. So if you're not saved, and you desire to give your life to Jesus so that you won't have to be defeated. I want you to just pause right where you are and just pray this prayer after me. Just repeat this prayer. We call it the prayer of salvation and repentance. If you desire to give your life to Jesus and receive all that he's offering for those who belong to him. Just say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me for all of my sins. Please come into my heart. And be my Lord and my Savior. The things that's wrong, I will no longer do. The things that's right, that will I do. I thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. I thank you, Jesus, for being resurrected for me. I thank you, Jesus, that if I ever come up short, of my walk in this life that you will be my advocate with the Father and I know that I will be forgiven when I repent of my sins I am saved because of what you have done in Jesus name Amen, Amen, Amen Father we thank you that we realize that the world that we live in, there are souls, and Father, they are there and they try to harm us, not always physically, but mostly mentally, and they desire to bring us down because they see something within us, and it's you. And they desire to have it, Father, but they don't just want to give up. Help us to live the life that you want us to live in the midst of spears and darts being thrown our way in the midst of living in an envious situation let it not take root within us but god let us pick up the harp and continue to do the work that you give us to do to continue to trust you in all things i pray for your people i pray that you will continue put us on one accord let us not be overtaken by the enemy's tricks traps, or any spirit of deception. And we give you praise and honor now. And I see you knocking spears to the left. I see you knocking them to the right. I see you giving us healing. I see you working out circumstances and situations. I see you giving us peace in the midst of trials and tribulation. I see you taking control of situations that there's no way that we can handle. All because we stand with you and we reject the influence of any spear that the devil throws against us. And it's in Jesus' name that we stand in victory. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, amen. At this time, we ask that you get your crackers, your bread, your juice, your water, whatever you're going to use as we commune with the Lord on today. Truly the Lord is good and we never ever want to allow circumstances to hinder us from doing the things that God gives to us to do because he'll always make a way. Church, he'll always make a way. Family, visitors, he will always make a way if we stay connected to him. So as we commune with the Lord today, I pray that there was nothing that's in your life. That I pray that you heard the prayer that I prayed, but at this time, if you did not pray along with me, just take a moment, go to the Lord for yourself. Ask him right now to forgive you for any sins of omission or commission that might hinder you from communing with him right now because this is fellowship and we must be in right standing as we fellowship with our Savior. 
So just pause right now. Go to him for yourself in 10 seconds and just ask him for forgiveness and direction. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood of Jesus. Thank you. Amen. In Jesus' name. And now if you would get your bread and your juice. The same night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it. He said, this is my body that is broken for you. Eat ye all of it. Hallelujah. After the same manner, when he had supped, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Drink ye all of it. You have done the will of the Lord. We thank God, amen, for another time of communing. Not only with our Lord and Savior, but with us, with each other. And we're on one accord. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. We continue to be in prayer for each other, for those who are going through and who have lost loved ones. We're praying that the peace of the Lord and his strength will continue to undergird and that we will continue to be a light in the midst of darkness for him and that we will be that love that will chase away hate. Amen. If this is your first time, amen, being with us on our broadcast here, on the online broadcast for the Unity Christian Church, and you would like to be a blessing to the work that we are continuing to do, and we are preparing the building, amen, for our time, uh, give us options and opportunities to do some things, not only inside, but outside, parking lot, inside as we continue to move forward, and things are moving in the right direction, yes they are, and we just ask everybody to complete the drill. Be patient and complete the drill, and we won't have hindrances going forward. So we are making our steps right now. You will get more information from us on that. But if you would like to be a blessing to this ministry, and you don't have the information to give, and you can always back up this uh, broadcast a little later if you miss it and get this information. But you can go to our website, which is uh, www.unitychristianchurch.org. And on the home page at the top right corner, you'll see a button that says online giving. Just click the button and follow the prompts. You can also go directly to our uh, giving site, which is Easy Tithe. We have a dedicated or a personal URL without going through our website. And you can go directly to our giving page by putting in your, in your browser, HTTPS colon forward slash, forward slash, easytithe.com, forward slash, UCC giving. Easytithe.com, forward slash, UCC giving. We also have a text giving number, a dedicated UCC text giving number, if you would like to give via text. That text number is 770-515-9799. Five one five nine seven nine nine. Or if you have a smartphone and you would like to download the Easy Tide mobile app, just go to your software store, your app store, download it, and go to Fayetteville, Georgia, and you should be you, should, you will find the Unity Christian Church listed under Fayetteville, Georgia, and you can give via that means as well. Just follow the prompts. So UCC family friends, we thank God for you once again, as as always. It is our desire to live the life that will bring a smile upon the Lord's face. And hatred in and of itself is not bad when we hate the things that God hates. But when we allow that fleshly hate to control us, then God is nowhere around. And we need to understand he will control the spears from the enemy so we can stay lined up with him. Now as we go down from this place today, oh God, we thank you for, you, for your word. We pray that you will continue to bless, lead, direct, and guide. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide henceforth now and forevermore. We go in peace and we sin no more. God bless you. You're dismissed. 
in the presence of our Lord and Savior, in Jesus' name, have your way. Amen, amen, and amen.